All right, uh, I wanted to show you a couple of illustrative pictures for the principles that we've looked at so far. Uh, here are a couple of applications. For thermal expansion, uh, here we've got two dissimilar metals in the top, and they're being heated up. And notice that if one of the metals expands more than the other, that can cause the metal to bubble. If that happens, then it can be used as a circuit breaker. So here, let's say we have steel and brass. And so at a higher temperature, if the brass tends to expand more rapidly than the steel, indicating a larger alpha value, then you could have that as a bimetallic strip that could cause the connection be electrically between uh, uh, two points, uh, say in a wire, if the wire is getting too hot, then the circuit breaker will uh, engage or disengage the circuit and cause the uh, current to stop flowing and uh, then once the temperature goes back to normal it's ready to go again. So you haven't blown a fuse uh, but it's something that reacts very quickly to changes in temperature. And so it's a lot better than the fuse boxes that they used to have in homes where you'd have a penny or a nickel sitting in there and when the penny melted that would break the fuse because then the fire department would come to the home and find the half melted penny and in the burned down remains of the house. And so this is a good example then of thermal expansion. Here's another one in a thermostat you can have a coiled bimetallic strip that has one side tend to become more or less coiled versus the other side as the temperature either rises or falls and then that can trip a switch that can turn uh, on or off your heater. <clears throat> Here we have a washer and we heat the washer up and you notice the hole gets bigger. Okay, So the hole doesn't get smaller. Some people like to think that maybe the metal would expand into the hole and make the hole smaller, but the metal expands by just the same amount on the outside of the hole as it would have expanded, and so that takes the hole along for the ride, basically. So the hole gets bigger at the same rate, as if there were actually metal of that same type inside of the hole. Now here, we have a plot that looks at temperature versus heat added, which is uh, for water. Now down here, you've got ice, which at lower temperatures also has a specific heat. It's about half that of water. And then here we have the conversion of uh, ice to water. And then here we have the conversion of zero degree centigrade water into 100 degrees centigrade along a lower slope because you have a higher specific heat for water than you do for ice. And then here, this actually extends on for quite a ways, but this has been suppressed by putting the little jaggle in there, but this is actually eight times longer than this part of the curve. And then when it goes to steam, that can still get hotter, but along a steeper slope. Okay, and so the slope there should actually be greater than the slope here. And so I just noticed that these slopes are somewhat comparable, but this should be about twice the slope, and this one should also be about twice the slope of the slope here, because the specific heat for steam, the specific heat for water, are both about half what the specific heat for water is. Okay, next, what I'd like to look at are methods of heat transfer. There are three different types I wanted to look at, and this is still all in chapter 17. So everything I've been looking at so far is still chapter 17. Uh, and so we have conduction. That's a way in which we can transfer heat from one object to another by means of molecular collisions. So in other words, one molecule will collide with the next, and that'll collide with the next. So let's say this is higher temperature, TH here. And then we've got some conductive substance connecting that to 
TL. So this is our lower temperature, that's our higher temperature, and this is our conducting medium. Now by conducting here, I don't mean conducting electricity, but conducting heat. However, something that's a good conductor of electricity also naturally tends to be a good conductor of heat as well. Okay, and so we could call this length here that the heat travels from the high temperature to the low temperature as being L. We can call the cross-sectional area A. <clears throat> and then we have a thermal conductivity K. Now thermal conductivity, just as was the case with our coefficient of linear expansion, thermal conductivity is a property of the substance. So typical values for K for a metal might be like 200. 200 what? <clears throat> Well, to understand that, we need to talk in terms of the rate of heat delivered. This is Q, total heat transferred, divided by time elapsed. It's equal to minus Ka times delta T over L. Okay, so here, A is the cross-sectional area and we know that the heat is going to go from hot to cold. So that means that the change in temperature is negative because we're going from higher to low. So T final is less than T initial. So that's what the negative means here, is that heat flows from hot to cold. K is our thermal conductivity. A is the area. And so if this has units of joules per second or watts, then K has to have units of watts per here, it's got to have watt meter, right, because L has units of meters, but A has units of meters squared. So sorry, that's going to be watt degree Kelvin per meter degree Kelvin. That's what it is. Watt per meter degree Kelvin. Okay, and so that'll, if we have this as watt per meter degree Kelvin, then this has units of meters, and uh, this has units of degrees Kelvin. So that'll work out. Okay, so the K for the metal then is on the order of hundreds. K for, let's say, a tile floor might be 0 0.5. K for wood might be 0 0.1. Okay, so the bigger values for K indicate faster rates of heat flow. And so that's what we're defining here then is the rate at which heat can flow is related to how easy it is for the heat to flow times the area that it flows through. So it's kind of like water flowing through a pipe. And delta T is the temperature change. That's kind of like pressure. The change in temperature is kind of analogous to pressure. And then the L here is the distance that the heat has to travel. So it's inversely proportional to the distance but directly proportional to the area and the change in temperature. <clears throat> okay, so if somebody asks you then to grab that hot pan off of the fire, and you do that with your hand here, uh, and this was right close to a fire, then you're gonna burn your hand, and you'll probably drop the food all over the floor. You'll have to quickly go to emergency. They'll bandage you up, uh, third degree burns, but you'll be fine a few years. <laughs> and then you go back later on. Somebody asks you, because they had to redo the dinner, would you mind uh, grabbing that, that pan off the fire? And so you go, oh, sure. But this time you wear an insulating glove. That insulating glove has a lower value for K, maybe in the order of 0.05. And so then the heat doesn't transfer through to your hand as quickly. Now, if you're walking along a tile floor, you're going to feel colder 
than if you're walking on a wood floor, but the tile and the wood have the same temperature. So what feels colder to you is just the rate of heat flow and not the actual temperature. You're not feeling the actual temperature. What you're feeling is the rate at which your foot is getting colder. And so that has to be in thermal equilibrium, right? The tile and the, the floor, because if they weren't, then he would flow until they were in thermal equilibrium. So the tile and the wood and the carpet are all at the same temperature. But what's different is the thermal conductivity. And so that's why you have to put on a pair of socks. Let's say if you're walking on tile, if you're working on wood or carpet, you may not need to put on those socks because your heat doesn't cool at such a rapid rate. Okay, so with those ideas in mind, let's look at one example <coughs> of conduction, and then we'll come back <coughs> to convection and radiation later. Let's say that the K value for a window here that is <coughs> 5 millimeters thick And the combined surface area of all of your windows, let's say, is on the order of, it will make this 2 meters by 1 meter. Okay, so that's not that much, but let's make it 10. Let's make this 5. So that it's like the combined surface area of all the windows in your house. So let's say inside of your house, the temperature is at... Uh, 30 degrees centigrade, nice toasty temperature, 27, let's make it. So that would be 300 Kelvin. <clears throat> then outside, let's say that it's minus uh, 3 degrees centigrade. So it's freezing cold outside. Uh, let's find if the thermal conductivity of the glass in your window is equal to 0.5, which might be typical for a solid pane of glass, then let's find the rate of heat flow out the window. <coughs> okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we know that heat is going to go from hot to cold. So our heat then, Q, is going to flow that way. And so we can write this expression here as Q over T equals, and here we're actually looking at the magnitude of it, because we know it's always going to go from hot to cold. As long as you understand that heat flows from hot to cold, you don't have to worry about that minus sign. Uh, because that just gives you the direction of heat flow, and, and we all know that that's which way it goes. So K then would be 0 0.5, that would be watts, which is joule per second per meter degree Kelvin, or degree centigrade, times the area, that's the length times the width, so let's call that 50 square meters, <laughs> times uh, delta T, that's the difference in temperature between T H and TL, so that's going to be 27 minus a negative 3 degrees centigrade over L, that's 5 millimeters, or 0 0.005, is that right? 5 millimeters is 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3, or 0 0.005 meters. <coughs> Okay, so I think we're going to be a little surprised by this result. You know, like normally we, you know, for energy economy, you'd always turn off a 100 watt light bulb in a room when you left the room. Uh, but do we always think about turning off the heater or even drawing the curtains? Not necessarily, but let's see how much bigger these numbers are in terms of heat loss. So here we've got 0.5, 50, 30, 5. <coughs> that gives us uh, 1 
150,000 watts. <clears throat> or 150,000 joules per second worth of energy leaving that house. Now this is a fairly big surface area. If this were just 10 square meters, then this would be divided by 5, and uh, so that would be 30,000 watts. <clears throat> Which is still an awful lot, because this would be the same thing as 300 100 watt light bulbs. So we turn off a 100 watt light bulb every time we leave the room, but this heat loss in a house that has 10 square meters on a cold day uh, of, uh, <coughs> of surface area is like leaving on 300 100 watt light bulbs. And so what can we do about that? Well, if you have a house that's up to code, what they'll do is they'll have windows that have a little insulating air gap in the middle of them. Okay? And so that's normally what's done when you replace windows is you upgrade them, bring them up to code. And by having that insulating air gap, this might lower the conductivity by another factor of 10. So that would lower this down to only 30 100 watt light bulbs. That's still a lot. Okay? But you might be able to uh, increase the uh, efficiency of the way that uh, you use energy a lot just by drawing some curtains. Because if you draw some curtains, that creates a dead air space. And that's a little bit like having the insulating air gap in the middle of your uh, dual pane windows. And so uh, this is uh, an example then of transferring heat. In this case, it's by one molecule hitting the molecule that's right next to it. And then that molecule hits the one that's right next to it then that molecule hits the one that's right next to it. And so then that creates a chain reaction of events that transmits the heat from one place to another. <clears throat> and so that's the principle of conduction. Now, we've seen examples of people that have walked on red hot coals. And we wondered, well, is that magic? You go, no, it's just physics. Uh, the conductivity of the ash in the red hot coals is so low that you can walk on red hot coals and the ash for the most part will protect you but this doesn't mean you're completely protected because you may come in direct contact with um, a hot ember and so people do burn their feet but not that often and it's because of the very low conductivity of the ash that surrounds it that you're able to walk on something that's hundreds of degrees that you would think might give you third degree burns all over your feet and walk along a whole, say, hundred yard track of it uh, uh, and uh, basically come out of the whole thing unscathed. <coughs> okay, so that's the idea then with conduction. Now with convection, a little different. Here we have heat transfer by mass motion of molecules. So an example of a convective process would be the wind or ocean currents. <clears throat> so associated with convection then, there's a lot of weather examples that work nicely to explain this. <clears throat> In our local mountains, let's say that uh, this is Mo uh, the ocean, this is Morro Bay, here, on the land. And then we go up into the inland valleys, let's say this is a Tascadero here. And so the ocean then has a high specific heat. Whereas the land has a low specific heat. Might be only one-fifth the specific heat for water. So what does that mean? 
means that energy that's coming from the sun, same amount of energy typically, is going to heat up the oceans less than it's going to heat up the land. And similarly at night, the land is going to cool off faster than the oceans will cool off. And so what will tend to happen then is that the land uh, experiences a larger heat increase. This is M. Smaller C, bigger change in temperature, right? Now, there's less mass too because in the ocean, that heat can distribute itself all the way down to like 10, 20 meters. But the heat here in the land only goes down a couple of inches. So there's less mass from that standpoint and also a lower specific heat. So that means that that land is going to heat up a lot more than the oceans are under the influence of a larger mass times a larger specific heat and so therefore a smaller change in the temperature. Okay. And so the oceans then tend to be a heat sink and they're difficult to change in temperature and uh, so areas then that are nearby to the coast tend to be cooler because they also feel the air that has been cooled by that cooler environment whereas the air up here is going to get warmer. So what happens to warmer air? Well, this is getting hotter, right? And so if we know this is getting hotter here, then warm air rises. So the warm air then goes up here, but that creates a low pressure near the surface. And so then that air cools and drops while this air here comes in to fill the low. So we get what's called an onshore flow. And this also tends to bring in fog from the coast. And so the coast gets fogged out. This air is drawn up to replace this slow. And then this high pressure area, or this low pressure area here is caused by the air leaving that area and leaving this as a low pressure, but then that air cools and drops. So we end up with a convection loop. What this convection loop does is it transports heat from the hot inland valleys to the coast. And so this then swamps out the uh, coast a lot of times in the summer with fog, particularly near Morro Bay. And then out here in the inland valleys, this cooler air, this cooler marine air eventually works its way in. So after a couple of days of this going on, finally the fog is brought in and will cool off the inland valleys for a couple of days and the convection loop will stop. Okay. And so that then is associated with what we call an onshore flow. That's an example of convection at work. Similarly in the oceans, we have say North America over here and we have Asia, here's Japan, and Russia, China, Vietnam. And so here, this is the equator. And so the ocean circulation in the northern hemisphere tends to be clockwise. And so what that does then is that takes cool water from the uh, polar regions and brings that water along the coast of California. And so our air tends to be cool here, or our water, I should, sorry, tends to be cold here. These are ocean currents. <clears throat> so this gives us a Mediterranean type of climate. Here's Florida on this side. East Coast, and then here's England and Europe. And so you got the same thing happening over here in Europe. So we have a Mediterranean climate because we have the same kind 
of cooler water flow coming in from the polar regions moving past uh, California that Europe and France and Spain, Great Britain have over there uh, <coughs> around the Atlantic. But what tends to happen here on this side is that the last thing that the water saw was the equator. And so that brings this warmer temperature water up along the east coast. And so that makes the east coast kind of a hothouse of high humidity and uh, so you want to like jump in the water all the time there uh, and uh, it gets very very hot during the summer whereas here things are moderated more more of a mediterranean type of climate uh, in the summer but then the water isn't such great water for jumping in either unless you go down by san diego or uh, you know, by that time the water's had more more time to heat up but those are all examples of convection then. Uh, we can either get convection of air molecules, convection of water molecules, or there are many other forms of convection as well. <coughs> Fine, and I'm not going to give you any equations for this, so the most you would see from the convection section is a conceptual uh, question. For radiation though, you can also if an object is at a certain temperature, it can release energy because of electromagnetic waves. So any object that's at a certain temperature is going to release electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> and associated with that, we have what's called a black body radiation curve. So if we plot the intensity for an object that's in thermal equilibrium, now what's intensity mean here? Well, that's power per unit area. That's a concentration of power on an area rather than the concentration of force on an area, as was the case with pressure. This is the concentration of power, like for example from the sun, watts per square meter. <clears throat> and we plot that versus the uh, On the horizontal axis here, we plot this versus the wavelength of the radiation. What we end up getting is what's called a black body radiation curve at a certain temperature. So this is a given temperature. Let's say the temperature in this case would be uh, 300 Kelvin. <clears throat> and this is how bright each of the individual wavelengths is. So what we find at 300 Kelvin is that the wavelength here might correspond to infrared radiation. Which would be on the order of uh, maybe uh, 900 nanometers or so for the wavelength of electromagnetic waves. Okay, so electromagnetic waves then can have all kinds of different wavelengths, all the way up to very, very high wavelengths here, which is low energy. This is more like radio. And then here at shorter wavelengths, we have like X-ray and gamma ray. So any object that's in thermal equilibrium is producing all of these different kinds of electromagnetic waves at once. And it follows what we call the black body radiation curve. So this is how radiation works then. And so why does this happen? Well, because the electrons and the atoms are all moving around. They're charged particles. When charged particles move, they produce electromagnetic waves. And so if we're sedentary, we're just standing around, uh, our heat losses are probably about half is from electromagnetic radiation. And half is from either conduction or convection. Okay? And so it's a big deal. Now if we're running, maybe not so much. You know, maybe then we'll have more conduction and convection. But, uh, 
if we're just sitting around, uh, you know, like watching a video or something, I don't know how often you do that, but if you're just watching a video, maybe half the energy that you would lose would be in electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> and so if we integrate all of these different wavelengths, what we find is that the total power radiated by an object is equal to something called our emissivity, which just tells us how well the object radiates heat. It can go from zero to one. If, it's, uh, if E is equal to one, it's a perfect black body. But if the emissivity is zero, then it's a lousy black body. You know, like, for example, snow is a lousy black body because it reflects most of the energy that comes in. And so if you're skiing, you get slow, snow blindness, but very little of it is absorbed by the surface. But it's a black surface of Dodger Stadium parking lot then the emissivity would be closer to one. It would be a perfect absorber as well as a radiator of electromagnetic radiation. And then, so that's what our emissivity represents. Times sigma, this is called our Stefan Boltzmann constant. And so this relates the power to the temperature. And our Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma, is kind of an easy number to remember. 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. 5678. <laughs> and I'll give you the units for that in a second. This is times area. So this is the total area of the object that's at some temperature, T, times, and catch this, temperature to the fourth power. Oh my gosh. So this is extremely temperature sensitive. So um, <clears throat> if we see that power has units of watts, which is joules per second, emissivity is unitless, area has units of square meters, and temperature to the fourth is Kelvin to the fourth. So that means sigma then would have units of watts per meter squared degrees Kelvin to the fourth. Also notice here, that the power radiated is related to the temperature and not delta T. So that means we have to use for the temperature degrees Kelvin and not degrees centigrade. Because zero degrees centigrade would tell us total power radiated. What does that mean? That would be dumb. So we'd have to use degrees Kelvin here, not degrees centigrade. So let's say we have a piece of metal. And for simplicity, we'll set the emissivity equal to 1. It's a thin piece of metal. It's one meter by two meters on a side. <clears throat> and thin, maybe one millimeter thick. Okay. And it has a uh, temperature, T, that's equal to 300 Kelvin. Now, I could give that to you in centigrade. I could give you it's 27 centigrade, then you'd say that's 273 plus 27 equals 300 Kelvin. So you just add 23, uh, in this case, uh, you just add uh, 273 to 27 to get the degrees Kelvin. Okay? And with an emissivity that's equal to 1, let's find the total power that's radiated. If it's one meter by two meters across. Okay, well, so here we've got one times sigma, our power then is one times 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth times the area. Now, the area you might say, well, that's got to be two times one meters squared. 
And so that would be an easy mistake to make because it's radiating heat off of this side, but it's also got two surfaces. Okay, so it's radiating heat off the second side too, the bottom side. So this is two times two meters by one meter. And then also you have the area of these little uh, uh, corner pieces, these little one millimeter thick things, but that is small, so I'm going to just neglect that. But we still have that. You have one milli or 0.01 times one, here you've got 0.01 uh, times two, and then you'd have two other sides to that, but that's still going to be just a fraction of one percent of the total area. So I'm going to neglect the thickness here and just say the total area is the area of, of one side plus the area of the other side. So it's two times that times 300 Kelvin to the fourth power. Okay, so this seems like a pretty small number here, but because the temperature is raised to the fourth power, that can overwhelm this small number and give you a pretty good value for the total power radiated. And this is just by electromagnetic waves. This is not including the possibility of conduction into, say, the air or convection or whatever else might be happening. Okay, so knock out this number. <clears throat> and we get. Uh, I think that's too high. Let me try that again. Okay, that's better. Okay, so that's one thousand eight hundred and thirty seven. So the power then that's radiated by this piece of metal at 300 degrees Kelvin is 18,000 watts or 1,800 watts. So that's a pretty large value. Now does that mean that that's the net amount of energy? No, not unless this is out in free space. If this is out in free space then it's probably not absorbing much energy. But typically you would also have energy coming in say from the outside. And so the net power difference would be the difference between the energy that's leaving and the energy that's coming in. Okay, and so that would depend on what other energy sources were nearby. But if this were just sitting out in outer space like this, uh, then we would have a uh, fairly significant power. Let me just run that through one more time, make sure that seems like a lot. That's it. Okay, 1837 watts. So that is a really, and so this shows that this is not a lightweight kind of heat transfer mechanism. This relates to the temperature to the fourth power. So we might wonder, well, what would happen to the power radiated if I doubled that temperature? So I went to 600 Kelvin. Well, if you raise 2 to the fourth power, that's 16. So at 2 times the temperature, the power increases by 2 to the fourth power, or 16 times more power at double the temperature. If you cut the temperature by a factor of two, it'd be one sixteenth as much. So we have this very, very strong dependence on temperature. And so just a little bit of a change in temperature of your body can give rise to a huge difference in the amount of, of uh, heat that leaves your body or enters your body if uh, it's coming from somewhere.
Okay, so that is your methods of heat transfer. The next thing I wanted to look at is the ideal gas law. <clears throat> so there are different aspects to this. Some of you, again, may have seen this in a chemistry class, but that's okay. An ideal gas, we have certain conditions that must be met. The atoms must be fairly far, far apart from each other. Now by far apart here, I mean many molecular diameters and not necessarily a huge distance apart in meters or something, but many molecular diameters. So that would be considered far. The atoms only interact by collisions. And typically, in an ideal gas, the uh, pressure is not too high and the temperature is not too low. Because if the pressure is too high, then the molecules are forced closer together. So that actually violates this atoms fairly far apart condition. Uh, and uh, uh, if they get close enough together, then you do have molecular forces that can start to act, called van der Waals forces. Uh, also, you don't want the temperature too low because that also allows for the molecules to get too close to each other uh, because they kind of settle down so they don't capture as much effective volume as they're moving around because if the temperature is low, that means that the RMS velocity is also lower. And so that means that they're not pushing on each other and making each other move apart as quickly. Okay, so these uh, atoms or molecules, this could be a molecule, as well. Um, <clears throat> have to be somewhat far apart from each other and only interact by means of molecular collisions and pressures too high and the temperatures too low. And so this all implies that there are no other forces acting between the molecules. other than the fact that the molecules will collide with each other. So, if, is this a good approximation? Because this can't be always right. Uh, and the answer is, at reasonable temperatures and pressures, this works fairly well. And so for an ideal gas, then, we can write that the pressure at some initial state times the volume at some initial state divided by the temperature at some initial state equals the pressure at some final state times the volume at some final state times the temperature at some final state. Okay. And so this then is true if and only if no molecules escape from the sample. So if the volume is constant, if V1 equals, so let, let's start here with some initial P1, V1, uh, and T1 conditions. And then we have here some P2, V2, T2 conditions. 
So it's the same amount of gas, but we've allowed it, in this case, let's say, to expand. Then this product of pressure times volume divided by temperature stays the same, as long as the number of molecules is a constant. Okay, so the units then for pressure can be pascals, they could be atmospheres for that matter. Uh, volume could be cubic meters, could be liters. Temperature though has to be degrees Kelvin because it's not a change in temperature. It's a state of temperature that we're talking about. So it's got to be degrees Kelvin. So let's look at an example of how this gas law would work. This is for an ideal gas. Let's say that we have a tire and uh, we uh, have a temperature in the house for the tire that's equal to uh, 27 degrees centigrade and we measure its pressure and we find that the pressure is equal to uh, and this is the gauge pressure. So that's not the total pressure, but the gauge pressure. In this case, the gauge pressure, let's say, is uh, 1.7 atmospheres. Okay. And so in terms of PSI, then, let's make it 2. That's a little better in terms of PSI. I'll take three. Make that three. Fourteen times three, that'd be about forty-two pounds per square inch, about three atmospheres for the gauge pressure. And so let's say that uh, you look in the manual and uh, you find that the uh, uh, P max, gauge max, that uh, this uh, tire can have before it'll blow is equal to uh, 3.4 atmospheres. So that's the maximum gauge pressure that that tire can have before it'll blow. Okay. And so that might be, I don't know, 48 psi or something like that. You know, something pretty high, okay? And, uh, but you're worried because you're going to take it out in the desert that day, and the temperature on the surface of the desert, uh, let's say, is uh, uh, 50 degrees centigrade, okay? So 50 degrees centigrade is, uh, uh, that's going to be, really, really hot. That might be like 130, 140 degrees. Okay. It's going to be a, a, but that's right there on the ground, you know, where you've got the absorption of the electromagnetic waves, right? Because the, the surface of the road acts like a black body uh, with an emissivity close to one. So it's going to absorb a lot of energy and that's going to bring the temperature of the road up really high. That's why if you walk around on asphalt with bare feet, your feet will tend to burn. But then if you jump on a white stripe, that has poor emissivity, right? And so that means that the emissivity would be close to zero because most of the energy would be fucked off, so it feels cooler. Okay? But the darker colors tend to absorb better, have higher emissivities. And so let's say that this is the temperature near the surface of the road that you're estimating. And so that'll be the temperature then that the tire will equilibrate with because it'll go into thermal equilibrium with the temperature of the road. And then it may even go higher because of the fact that there's a friction and other uh, forms of heat inside. But let's just say that that's the temperature of the tire after it's been on the desert road for a while. And let's just say this is a constant volume process. So V1 equals V2. Now, this isn't exactly going to be true because we know that when a tire gets pumped up more, you can tell that it's 
more pumped up. And uh, so there is a change in the volume, and you can tell by just looking at the shape of the tire that that's true. But let's say it's not a big change, maybe only a few percent. Not enough for us to make a big deal about here. I'll show you how to do this if you don't make this assumption later. But for the moment, let's use this equation and let's ask, will the tire blow? Because that's what you're worried about, is that your tires are going to blow when they get to this kind of very high temperature condition, and that that's going to result in the pressure going up past the uh, allowed values. Now here I'm going to take the volumes out of this equation because we're calling it a constant volume process. And so this we can see is a pretty simple equation, but it can be a unit nightmare if you don't get the units right. It's okay to use atmospheres for pressure because the units are going to tend to cancel. But you can't use gauge pressure. You have to use absolute pressure. So P1 is not 3, but 4. 3 plus 1 is 4 atmospheres. Okay, so that's what you put in for P1. And so when you solve for P2, that's going to be total pressure, too, and not gauge pressure. Okay, and so we can write this then as, and then T isn't 27, right? Because you have to convert this to degrees Kelvin. So this is going to be uh, 300 Kelvin. So that's another place where you can make a mistake. You could write this down as gauge pressure and that in degrees centigrade. Then you've made two huge unit errors. Okay, but here, this is going to be 300, and uh, this will be four atmospheres for P total. So we can write then P1 is four atmospheres divided by 300 Kelvin equals P2 divided by T2. So 50 centigrade, 50 plus 273, is 323, uh, is that right? 50 plus 273, 7 and 5 is 12. Yeah, so that'd be 323 Kelvin. So P2 is equal to 4 atmospheres times 323 divided by 300. Now we know it's going to be bigger than the original pressure because we've heated it up. You know that something gets hotter is the molecules are going to be moving faster and therefore it's going to be generating more pressure when it hits the surface of the, the inside surface of the wheel. So here we just need to figure out how much more pressure that corresponds to as this thing heats up from 27 to 50 degrees centigrade. So that's just the ratio of 323 to 300 uh, times uh, 4. So that gives us 4.3 atmospheres. So does this mean that the tire blows? Well, let's see here. The tire is rated for 3.4 atmospheres, and we're all the way up at 4.3. So it looks like it's going to blow. But wait a minute. This is gauge pressure, not absolute pressure. So to compare this to the maximum gauge pressure, we have to subtract one atmosphere away. So P2 gauge equals P2 minus one atmosphere or that's equal to 3.3 atmospheres. We compare that to 3.4 and we see that we're okay. <clears throat> so we go driving out into the desert. Unfortunately, the tire was worn down to its third level of cord, and uh, so it did blow. <laughs> but it wasn't because uh, yeah, a new tire would have been okay. All right? And so that's a way then to handle this equation uh, if we assume it's constant volume. However, what if uh, V2 is equal to uh, 1.05 times V1? 
other words, a 5% increase in volume. Can we still use a version of this equation? Well, yeah. Now we put in the V1 and V2, but now V2 we can write as 1.05 times V1. And then, you probably want to rewrite this if you're taking notes, rather than just trying to plug in the way I am here. But the V1s would cancel, so what you'd end up with is P2 equals uh, P1 times T2 over T1 time, uh, divided by 1.05. So the pressure has dropped a little because it's expanded. And when it expands, that means that the molecules have farther to go and they're more spread out. They're not hitting the same area anymore and they've got farther to go to get to that area. And so that means that the pressure should drop. <coughs> so what we had before was 4.3 divided by 1.05. This was from before, the 4.3, but now this is our correction factor. So that gives us 4.1. So P2 now is 4.1 atmosphere and P2 gauge would be 3.1 atmospheres. So that's even better. So by allowing for a little bit of an expansion of the volume, that is going to drop the pressure down a little more because that means that those molecules are spread out over a bigger volume, are going to hit a bigger area, and that means the, the force is spread out over a bigger area, and and also, if the molecules don't collide as often if they've got farther to go between collisions. And so all of that then works its way into this version of the ideal gas law. Okay, now this quite naturally leads itself to the equation of state for an ideal gas. Because if P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2, that's equal to P3V3 over V3, uh, T3. If we change it a third time, if we change it a fourth time, it's equal to P4V4 over T4. Then we say that all of these, the combination of pressure times volume over temperature has to equal constant. Because that ratio, pressure times volume divided by temperature, is the same. But because the number of molecules stays the same, it has to be some constant times the number of molecules. Because more molecules or less molecules is going to change this ratio. And so it turns out that this uh, constant is our Boltzmann constant, K. So we can write this then as K, our Boltzmann constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23, it's joules per molecule, degree Kelvin, times the number of particles in the gas. Now this is also equal to little n times r, where n is the number of moles, and r is our gas constant. So you may have seen this in a slightly different form. We can write this either as PV equals NKT or PV equals little n RT. And these are equivalent because NR here and NK are the same values. Here N, the number of molecules, <coughs> divided by Avogadro's number, 
write this out. Uh, N is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms. And that's what we call one mole. Okay. So if we write uh, R then as this is Avogadro's number. We write this as n times k. Then k is just equal to our gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. And so that's equal to 8.314 and that's uh, joules per mole uh, degree Kelvin divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Okay, so if we wanted to use number of moles, then we use 8.314 here, and this would be multiples of 6.02 times 10 to the and so that's the version of PV equals nRT that you may have seen in a chemistry class. For physics, though, most of the time we're going to use this form because this form deals with individual molecules and we're not quite so interested in moles here. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is, uh, using this equation, I'd like to find the volume of one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure. Now by standard temperature and pressure, what I mean is zero degrees centigrade and one atmosphere's pressure. And this, by the way, is a very kind of famous result from chemistry. And I'm going to do it just using this physics form of the equation. So, one atmosphere's pressure is going to need to be in pascals because K here is units that are in terms of joules. This is uh, uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per molecule degree Kelvin. Okay, so that means that the volume of this ideal gas is going to be NKT divided by P. So that'll be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, not one, that's molecules. Okay, so that's our end value times K, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per molecule degree Kelvin. times the temperature. Now that can't be zero here. You have to be really careful here. This is 273 Kelvin. And then that'll be divided by P, but if you're using units of joules here, then you're stuck with Pascal's for pressure because Pascal's is Newton per square meter. So you have to stay in your meter, kilogram, seconds, units, and then the volume will be in cubic meters. So we'll divide this by 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth power pascals. And so when we work this out, this is 22.4 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. But 10 to the 3 liters is equal to, liters about a quart. Okay? And so 1,000 liters is 1 cubic meter. So we can write this then as 22.4 liters. So the volume of one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure is about 22.4 liters. And so that is a chemistry result. But in our physics terminology, we can write that in terms of cubic meters. And so we will have opportunities then to use 
the, uh, <clears throat> the ideal gas law uh, next week after the midterm when we get into uh, processes that involve thermodynamics. Okay, and so I'll have one last uh, pretty good lecture for you uh, following the midterm on thermodynamics and, and we'll pick up from where we left off here. So you'll see that some of this material that we just talked about is from chapter 18. So we've basically then gone all the way through chapter 17 and we've touched on the ideal gas law and so basically then we've gone through kinetic molecular theory for an ideal gas and so in chapter 18 then we also did heat capacities and the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so we've done a lot of chapter 18, uh, all the way up through, uh, uh, let's say, 18.4. So the midterm up through 18.4. Sure, and double check not only what I've done in these lectures to get ready for that, but also uh, what I've assigned in the Master in Physics that's due coming up, and um, also uh, those three uh, videos on a crash course in physics. Good luck on the exam.